Hello and welcome to Tisky Sour. It's a family affair today. I'm very excited to be joined by Ash Sarkar, Senior Editor of Navarra Media. Hey. And Sean Fay of Sean This Way fame. Hi. Uh, also prolific writer, campaigner and stand-up comedian. Yeah, how's that's the, me. How's the comedian career going? It's going okay. I'm doing a fundraiser for the new LGBTQ Community Centre in East London on Friday night. This Friday? That. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, so come on. on. I've only seen your stand-up on Twitter and it's... I was very impressed, but I'd love to see Thanks. it in real yeah, life. Thanks, yeah, that was my f- friend just doing it on a phone, but I'm going to have to get someone to actually go video me one time, but only when it's good. Gary! <laughs> get Gary! All right. <laughs> <laughs> Gary's like the little whinny coming from like the tech desk. I was like, you're giving me more work. I can't believe you called it a family affair and we didn't say anything about hateration in the dancery. I'm <laughs> so upset. I don't know, that's gone over my head. Mary Jane Blige. <laughs> Shit, that's embarrassing, isn't it? I hate yeah. when things get said about pop culture that just go over my head and it's live on you. Uh, ugh, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about some big issues today. The current state of trans rights in Britain, transphobia online and offline. The limits of what should be up for debate. But before that, there's an issue so central to social justice, it would be remiss for us to ignore it. In fact, it's a controversy <laughs> considered so important that Theresa May's spokesperson was asked about it today, uh, whether or not number 10 would intervene. Uh, This is the issue of probably one of the most marginalised groups in Britain, Gammon. Uh, Ash, is Gammon a racial slur? I mean, I don't know if it's a racial slur, but it's certainly haram. So gammon, <laughs> um, gammon refers to a particular kind of property-owning, middle-aged, Middle England white dude who wants nothing more than for Top Gear to, you know, bring back Jeremy Clarkson and it for, you know, be pride of place in the BBC and also for us all to die in a nuclear holocaust. Those are the two central uh, demands of the gammonites. Um, and after, I mean, that's, you know, this kind of, you know, is it or is it not a racial slur has been ticking along for a little bit. And then Lucy Fisher at the Times wrote an article about it saying that was very upsetting to lots of people. And Aaron, Aaron Bastani was, was quoted in it as calling <laughs> Mike Gapes um, <laughs> King friend, Gammon of the Gammonites. Friend of the show, Mike Gapes, <laughs> long term friend of the show. Um, I always describe him as the man whose name is a full sentence, which no one else finds funny. Yeah, I was going to say Gapes. You don't need to be, you don't need Gammon if that's your name. <laughs> <laughs> so what I find hilarious about this having you know been um, front and centre of some of the um, Twitter fraff today is that it's a term that white people most notably and with the most panache Matt Zab, call other white people and yet it's now like is it racist against white people would it be okay if you know for instance we called you know Asian people packy then it's like no that wouldn't be okay (laughs) and why did you bring us into this we were you know sitting down over there with our samosas and like three quarters of a paycheck quite happily before you brought us into it and I think that it's really striking for a number of reasons Um, and I think we can get into uh, the value judgment in it because I know that Sean's got a lot to say about it but I think one of the reasons why people are really upset by it is because it takes a demographic who is seen as the arbiter of common sense politics, property owning, middle England, male, white, Mm. and says, well, hang on, you don't have a natural authority or credibility here. And worse still to make fun of some of their more absurd positions, like would you commit to a first strike nuclear policy, Mm. which defeats the fucking point of deterrence. That's what the word deterrence is there for. Um, It's that it undermines this whole like a priori claim to Um, power and to whose concerns are deemed legitimate and whose aren't that's why people are upset that's the real tea on the gammon beef because that's where it emerged wasn't it so gammon beef the gammon grill upset about it now because i mean as you were saying it has uh, some relation to like physical features i mean matt's a white guy calling up a white guy's gammon but matt's kind of like young and hot you know I mean, but it, according it emerged, to you. It, yeah, of course, according to me. A dish. But my standards are quite, you know. <laughs> a dish, not that <laughs> Yeah. A dish, not a uh, <laughs> But it emerged, the phrase emerged because in the debate during the general election, there was all these men in the audience of Question Time mm. who were asking, would you blow up a country with a nuclear bomb? And they were being sort of posited as the voice of common sense and sort of like the everyday normal person. So this was to sort of uh, point, it just came up. A picture of all of them with some gammon. The wall of gammon. I love the wall of gammon. Sean, what do you think? (laughs) Yeah, so like, I think like, yeah, picking up on what um, 
I should, well, the first thing about whether or not it's a slur, I don't think it's a racial slur, or at least um, I feel like when you say racist, obviously it's about whether or not that has the, like, the power dynamics to be, you know, to, to name people, whether that has kind of any kind of like social impact in the same way that it does when it's for the reverse white people with people of colour. So I don't think that like, racist slur are complete. If it's a slur, I think it's about whether or not you consider, I actually do think a lot of the things that like are contested probably are slurs, but it's like whether or not it's necessarily bad. I think like, I think it's interesting, yeah, because I think, like Ash said, it's like the one group who are not used to it. I think like, any minority group and all women pretty much are used to like some kind of feature being used metonymically to like reduce you to something. And like just that group being like reduced to a pinkish hue and kind of like a round face, like they're, they're not used to it. And obviously there's like a huge outcry and not sure where to place those feelings. I don't know. I feel like there's been a lot on Twitter about. Uh, I feel like it can get a little bit like closed shop anyway and people endlessly debating this it sort of becomes like a sideshow that can become quite exclusive and quite boring to watch and I'm never really sure how much like if you make a flippant joke at like an old white guy who's rich it's kind of fine but like endlessly defending using the same tactics as bigoted people do you, you know do you, agree, do you agree with Helen Lewis that it's problematic that people chose gammon and not prosciutto <laughs> Prosciutto, darling. Prosciutto. Is that how you pronounce it? Uh, that's how I pronounce it. She said it. another ham that I didn't, I'd never uh, heard of. Bruschella. No, that... Brasaula, <laughs> I think. Okay, yeah. Uh, is, is it classist? <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that like... It's the tweets up there now. Like, no, look, I'm sorry. I can't hold it in anymore. Gammon is such a loaded insult because it implies in a sneering way that the person you're talking about is working class. People aren't being called pastrami, parma ham or <laughs> Brasaula. Brasaula. <laughs> I what? mean, why would you call someone palm my hand? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, I look mean, at the shape of a gammon. It's, like, it's a much thicker <laughs> consistency of the meat. But also, like, I could kind of imagine calling it Parmaham sort of like the twink version of a gammon. Yeah, maybe. All right. I mean, <laughs> who who would you call Parmaham then? Like, uh, that maybe that guy who's the Tory, the Tory young twink who talks about Brexit on TV. Tom Harwood. Yeah. <laughs> You got that straight away. <laughs> because he's the, he's the right wing you. Yeah. <laughs> I was drawing blanks. I was just like... Yeah. Like, also, we like, can I just say, um, in this space, as a minority cisgender heterosexual woman, I find some of this language very exclusionary. Like, I don't know what a twink is. Isn't that like the Milky Bar Kid? You don't know what a twink is? I have inferred <laughs> that it's Milky Bar Kid adjacent. Um, well, you can look it up. We'll tell you afterwards. Uh, let's it move on. We're going to move on from mood. salted meats to the serious issue of the day, uh, which is trans rights, which have been in the public spotlight over the last year or so because of proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act and organised opposition to these changes from trans exclusionary radical feminists working in alliance with sections of the mainstream press, most viciously probably the Times or most consistently. Mm. Uh, it's in this context that last week Channel 4 held a debate as part of their Gender Quake series with public figures including Caitlyn Jenner, Jermaine Greer, Monroe Bergdorf, and our very own Ash Sarkar. Mm. This show was quite controversial in the end. Ash, can you explain to us what happened in this debate? So, I mean, just to talk through the format for people that didn't watch it, because, I don't know, they have lives, um, it was set up like a really plush, chintzy bear pit. So there were kind of these deep, velvety sofas in the middle of a big hall, and that was where uh, myself and the other panelists and the chair, Kathy Newman, were arranged. And then surrounding us, like, you know, in c concentric circles, kind of, um, was the audience. And there'd been really tight security, like, we weren't allowed to know the venue um, straight away, but it emerged, like, quite quickly that there'd just been either really shoddy or completely absent vetting because I walked in and even as someone who isn't particularly plugged into lots of the stuff around like trans rights and trans activism, um, I recognized like some of the most prominent TERFs, some of whom had already had a pop, up, pop at me before, um, sitting right behind me. Mm -hmm. And as for the debate itself, I think um, there was very little conversation between the panelists. Um, it was kind of like everyone had their set piece and it made it sort of hard to challenge and come back on particular points. Um, but I think that even the most vile aspects of the formal debate would have been manageable had it not been for the audience. So like I said, there were some very prominent uh, trans exclusion radical feminists there who were just heckling, in particular Monroe Bergdorf, relentlessly. And 
I don't know how much of it was audible to the audience at home, but it was incredibly aggressive, incredibly dehumanizing and really puerile. Mm. Like it descended into literally people just howling the word penis at Monroe, going from things which like were syntactically, I could recognize the sentences to just bellowing body parts over the course of an hour. And um, despite a floor manager coming up to me and assuring me that should certain people heckle again, they'd be removed. When they did heckle again, they were not removed. Monroe asked on camera for someone to be removed and that didn't happen. So um, you say it was a controversial show. I would say it was a clusterfuck. Mm. I think Um, you're also being too kind to Channel 4 when you say it was a failure in vetting because it seemed quite specific that they'd invited mm. a lot of trans exclusionary radical feminists and they'd given them front row seats mm. so i was there i ended up a friend texted me at the last minute saying do you want to go see this I was like oh ash is in it i'll go along uh but we we didn't get free drinks mm. <laughs> but the turfs all got free drinks and they all got so they were all they, so were, they were on, on the a green guest, room. they were on a yeah. specific guest list mm. they'd been it wasn't they hadn't been vetted out it's they'd been specifically invited yeah. and given front row seats and the producer said sort of like we're encouraging sort of like noise and participation from the audience and whoop if yeah. you like a whoop if you like a point you know it was an invite for Mm. people to be loud and what they had done is they invited some trans activists trans people and surrounded them with people who were known transphobes which just seemed incredibly irresponsible it it was crazy like i when the show finished i think i got caught in the credits like turning around and like giving someone both barrels because uh just this woman was like you're a handmaiden you know you're fucking disgusting this and the other like really abusive Mm. and i was just like if you want to go, we can go. Like, first offence, time out of good behaviour. I'll take the years. <laughs> Sean, you uh, you tweeted that you were asked, but you turned down yeah. an appearance. Uh, do you want to explain why? Yeah, I guess, like, so for context, like, well, from my kind of vantage point, um, I came out as trans and started my transition two years ago. I also, like, literally around the same time, started, like, a career in the media and, like, started working with Navara and other places. Uh, and this is just when this has kind of stepped up a ramp in terms of like the the trans uh, inquiry uh, the government had. It was also in 2015. So that's like over the last two and a half years. So I've had kind of my own personal journey, my media career happening at the same time as this like huge upswell in transphobia. And what I have like learned in that time very quickly is I am asked several times a month. Um, I'll have a conversation with a television producer who is very nice. I'll run through all the main points about uh, the, the legislation that's under review about the dispute with trans exclusionary radical feminists, if we want to call them that. And um, uh, what, yeah, what would you want to call them? Sorry. That's well, you. I mean, like, I would say that it's kind of a strange cohort of like, certainly that is the banner that they, that you, you can most easily say they gather under. But I would say it's a kind of odd mixture of kind of like um, uh, odd reactionaries who actually remind me more of kind of like Anita Bryant and Mary Whitehouse, kind of like mm. like Middle England conservatives that don't often like are quite sexually conservative. Also, for example, don't like drag queens, um, you know, just like quite prim. Then there's obviously a lesbian separatism, radical feminist politics, which obviously there are some uh, women from that kind of feminist tradition who are there. And then there are just sort of bitter internet haters. And then they all sort of gather under what you could call turf. But I think actually, when you look at it more closely, anyway. um, And there's also an irony, right? It's not trans exclusionary. In fact, their whole feminist identity is centered around the policing of trans women out of public life. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and in some cases, I mean, like historically, there is a a feminist tradition that goes back to the 70s in which like like Janice Raymond, these kind of radical feminists from the 70s who wrote texts that basically said transsexualism should be morally mandated out of existence. Um, And, you know, like, essentially Janice Raymond wrote all transsexuals, and she only meant trans women, all transsexuals rape women's bodies by appropriating that body for themselves. So, like, there is a kind of really nasty, vicious theoretical strain in feminism. But I don't believe that everyone now who harasses trans women um, or who was probably at that quite falls into that category mm. i think it's i think a lot of women have become radicalized online um in certain forums i've been very public on twitter about Mumsnet, um which obviously people can be like that's a, that's a strange organization but like literally because it's just forums that are obviously moderated um there can be you know extensive conversations like if you look at the feminism board it's almost entirely about transphobia um but yeah so like i think like every week it feels like i've been asked to comment on this i have a very nice conversation with a television producer or pretty much every major news channel in the UK 
And then I say, by the way, I'm not going to participate in a debate on my identity or I'm not going to be on a platform with, share a platform with anyone that would like, has or would call me a man or other trans women men. And they go, okay. And then that's always what happens. Like that's always when they come back and I push them. And yeah, I just have had a policy of not engaging in those kind of things. Like I felt like Ash and I spoke about it before and it's very different. I think it was good to have, uh, and that's not something that's typical, is to have a cisgender woman who is allied with, like, because the, you mm. know, there is. And that's why they can often frame it as feminists versus yes, trans women. Yeah, exactly. Right? So that was actually pretty important, pretty unique. But um, I believe that all of this television, is, as, as what happened showed, is essentially it's a theatre of trans misogyny, trans misogyny being the hatred of transgender women for being trans and women and trans women. Um, to the exclusion, there were trans masculine people on that panel, but almost like there is no discussion. It is entirely about the spectacle of the man in the dress and the women who won't accept it. And um, I feel like whenever I've engaged in those kind of forums, even like a little bit, it's like I'm almost more worried about how I look than what I say, because I'm thinking, do I look too much like a man? Am I being assessed on how feminine I am? Am I, are people weighing up? Like, am I too tall? Would I be at risk in women's toilets? All things I do, by the way, use women's toilets, use cha- women's changing rooms. And suddenly I'm having to like explain myself. And there's something for me that I find a media system that draws trans people in um, to do that toxic and I won't take part in it. Um, And with Channel 4, what I didn't like as well is that they, um, I I suppose like there's a group of people that are professional journalists who choose this, but they increasingly approach trans people who are newer and newer or further remote to media work, some of whom have never engaged with like mainstream media before and offer them large sums of money. And I think that's deeply unethical Mm. for a community that often doesn't have very much money. Because in in a way watching it, I was, I almost felt like it was strategically useful that this was happening because the turfs were being so unpleasant. You know, it was so clear what was going on and that that was all live on TV. If I was sort of like a turf campaigner, I would have thought, oh, that was a shit show for a sort of like our campaign because it's outed us as being really horrible. <laughs> but at the same time, it's subjected two trans people to live transphobia to live on like, TV. Mm, which you have is, to think, do the Westboro Baptist Church care about looking horrible when they did a documentary? Like, there is a call. There are some respectable people in the media who want to dress up in kind of feminist respectability um, and would be published by like editors at The Guardian, The Observer, The New Statesman, or whatever, who go through an editorial process who are uh, um, presenting a respectable face to legitimate concerns around trans people, particularly trans women. But then there are just zealots like the Westboro Baptist Church who mm. do not care. They believe so, so earnestly that they are correct and that they are on the side of right and they must speak out and they must name trans women as men it doesn't matter with them what they look like on tv and almost there can be a bunker mentality again like um religious extremists where the more that people tell them they're wrong the more it's almost a vindication that they're right because the more that they're a sole voice against a madness that has taken hold of society in the form of like trans acceptance um the more that they're proved that like yeah that they're on the side of right I mean, I think in terms of um, like breaking out of the confines of that room a bit and then thinking about how it's received by uh, the audience mm. at large, that my mum watched Genderquake and my mum's journey in terms of thinking about trans rights is very, very similar to my own, which is a few years ago, I would never have thought of myself as actively transphobic, but I certainly held a lot of lazily exclusionary assumptions and views because they simply never had to come up against someone else's lived experience. And the lion's share of my learning was done not in um, explicitly politicized spaces. It wasn't through reading, it was through developing a friendship with a trans woman at university and uh, her just sort of sharing bits of her Mm. life with me. So we would be out and suddenly I would see how she was navigating the world, navigating toilets, navigating changing rooms. And that had a tremendous and powerful impact on me. Now, not everyone is lucky enough to have a friendship like that for lots of different reasons. Also, it is not trans women's job to like, you know, befriend a clueless cisgender person, be like, okay, like this is like my zakat, like I guess I have to do this, like you know, like paying tithes of of, of some sort. But that's how I learn, and it was it was through something that was very very human. And my mum watching Genderquake was again someone who, you know, wouldn't have thought of herself as transphobic, but certainly when it, uh, you know, came to things like uh, those 
what hormone blockers for like mm. delaying puberty like yeah. would have been like oh that sounds too young and like yeah. that would have been yeah, like of course. you know a, a, a knee jerk response is that for her listening to uh, Kenny Jones was tremendously powerful and she was mm. like it has made me check myself on all these different things and to see someone uh, be able to uh, communicate something so specific about their experience which has really challenged me in the face of these like you know howling coyotes was tremendously powerful and it was both those things together was like seeing the hostility and um, also seeing the kind of the grace and poise uh, in front of that now that doesn't make it any less a spectacle mm. but in terms of you know does it serve a purpose of further isolating um, a particularly virulent tendency of like you know transphobic discourse mm. I think ultimately yes should it have happened no yeah and I think that's the difficult yeah, I think that's that the, yeah and I would say yeah it, it requires like yeah the phrase I would probably yeah like a, like a trans sacrificial lamb which obviously like you know M- Monroe Bergdorf is a friend of mine I've spoken to her about it before I think she knew I don't think she knew it was going to be quite that bad but like I think she knew that she was like you know and I think like any of us that um, do media work as trans women um, appreciate that that's a large part of what we do mm. and we have to take a lot of abuse and that is almost like a kind of like weird built-in part of the co- like if I was advising a young trans woman who wanted to like work in the media I'd be like you have to like you have to get some kind of coping strategy for mm. the abuse that's going to come because that's part of it it's, also, it's worth saying how incredible Monroe Bergdorf's sort of response was she yeah. acted with like well, such again, poise it's and grace she has and... to be yeah, you have to be poised and graceful I mean I suppose she's, she's of... done it a lot she's yeah. had abuse on TV yeah. quite a lot and I feel like yeah and she would have and she would have like there's nothing that someone could shout at you in that TV studio that you wouldn't have heard a million times before and she was incredibly graceful and she kind of is and I think that's always like been her strength actually um um, oh, she's a pro. Just, she yeah, is and just a when she, pro. Even, yeah, even when she's spoken about race in the past, like I think Piers Morgan, when he had her on, mm. like was expecting, mm. you know, like an angry black woman, and that that was what was being, and like you know, she managed to actually largely turn around quite a lot of opinion, surprisingly, in that forum. So I think she's like, yeah, a pro. <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit about the actual debate because mm-hmm. there were some pr- surprising elements of it. Uh, the most surprising element for me, maybe you as well, was Jermaine Greer not seeming to hold any. Position. I mean, she was the most controversial person on the panel because she said some awfully transphobic things in the past. But she just claimed to have forgotten all of them. So when she was am challenged I... on it, she said, I don't even remember going on the Victoria Derbyshire show. Am I allowed to spill some tea or am I opening myself up to a libel suit? Well, if it's true, I think you can say it. Oh, it's true. Like, she was half cut. Like, the whole time. Mm. Like, Been the there. producers had to, like, <laughs> get her from the pub. She was, like, necking one. That's why she couldn't remember anything. That's why, like, you know, <laughs> she was just, like, I mean, my God. Like, she was drinking, like, harder than me at Eid. Like, it was, <laughs> you know, it was, it was spectacular. Um, and so, you know, what position does she hold? I don't think she holds a position. I think that she's a deeply nasty person. I think her feminism has always been nasty. It's always been predicated on the exclusion or degradation of either trans people or people of colour more generally. Um, Mm. And, yeah, actually during one of the breaks, we got into it about Casta Semenya um, because she'd been slagging off Casta Semenya and saying uh, no one ever asked Casta Semenya's capacity. Do you want to explain who Casta Semenya is? Oh, Casta Semenya, the South African 800 metres runner? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about running. Um... I, I do know I love Casta Semenya um, and I think I think she... we all know more about Casta Semenya than we do about running <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's true yeah. I mean the thing I generally like sports I just I really like the sprinty ones because I don't have to focus for very long yeah. um, I, I mean the 800 metres doesn't last that long Ash I have a very short attention span Michael <laughs> sorry go on explain who Casta Semenya is um, anyway so um, and I think she has a um, hormone condition so yeah hyper, condition? hyper androgenism like she, essentially an excess of testosterone within normal cisgender female range. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and she's been subject to the most invasive kind of medical testing because people are saying that she has an unfair advantage against white female competitors, essentially. Hmm. And Jermaine Greer was like, was saying no one ever asks her competitors how they feel. And then when we cut to an ad break, I was like, that's just simply not true. As someone who both loves sports and journalism, I can tell you that every single sports journalist, whenever Casta Semenya uh, wins a race, um, you know, goes and interviews some crying white woman or her teammates. And that's always the story. And Jeremy was like, oh, well, I've never seen it. And then I was like, you know, and I think it's quite striking that we're pouring over a black woman's body and saying, compared to white women in her field, she doesn't deserve to be mm. here because there's something inherently more masculine about her. And Jermaine Greer was like, um, 
well, I just don't think that's true. I think Casa Semenya is um, suspicious because of this, 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 and this. And I couldn't help myself. I was like, well, I just think it's very impressive that in addition to being a writer and an academic, that you're also Casta Semenya's trainer. To which Jermaine Greer was like, are you sneering at me? And I was like, I think I am sneering at you, yes. And, she, and then Jermaine, Jermaine Greer went, from what position do you think you're able to sneer at me? And I was like, well, I'm a writer and an academic too. I'm an equal. And she did not like that. Mm-hmm. And like, yeah. she didn't, you know, and that's the thing is that like, actually there is this whole, and, you know, and I think it was also mirrored in like some of her comments on the panel. She's going, she's talking about the marginalization of older women. And I think that that is a tremendously, you know, horrendous facet of patriarchy is the marginalization of older women. She kept going on about like Miss, Mrs. Brown boy, Mrs. Brown's boys, which I've never watched. Mm-hmm. I was like, if the worst thing you can think of affecting your life is the existence of Mrs. Brown's boys, like get some bigger it problems. It is a bad show. Like it's a <laughs> shit show. Yeah, I mean it's a terrible show. But it doesn't really have much to do with. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and transgender so, and so people. it's just like like kind of obsessive centering of like mm. you know what is my experience of what yeah. I've heard and how can that be the central organizing well, tenet yeah. of everyone. I mean, I feel I feel like that's like very um, common. Um, and I feel like it's a dynamic that's replicated, for example, when women of colour are addressing their problems with white women. Like, the, as white women, we can tend to be like, mm, well, okay, but what about sexism that we experience when a woman of colour is trying to raise something about the, the dynamic between white women and women of colour? And similarly, with tr- trans women and cisgender women, I find so often that I will attempt to explain something about the experience of transphobia and instantly a cisgender woman will respond with, something about the fact that she's given birth or, um, you know, the gendered labor that she's had to perform throughout her life or whatever. And it's like, you know, that's true, but I, it's not about transphobia. Like why, you can't just replicate. That's not a, that's not an equal and fair discussion. Mm. Um, and that can be done even when the person isn't transphobic, or, uh, like overtly, is that, that, yeah, there would just be this kind of like recentering of like, actually, no, I'm, I'd like to talk about um, so, so, you know, this happens a lot of the time with um, biology, is that I think, like, often trans women are saying, but, like, our our biology, our reproductive issues, which we do have, are, like, are not centred in feminism at all. And instantly there'll be, like, a, well, what about abortion? Look at what's happening in the Republic of Ireland. And you're like, yeah, that, that's true. That's not what was under discussion, though. And I feel like that derailment is quite common. But also, why do we have to be the same? Like, mm. why... Like, why and also like you can go through things that I don't experience mm. I don't even have to understand half of it yeah. like you know all that matters is that like we have equality under the law and I'm not going to be a prick to you and I'll make yeah. some attempt to understand even if I can't like fully yeah. get my head around some stuff and that's the most I expect from white people as well yeah and yeah. and I, I don't understand why there has to be this insistence on you know um a homogenizing of subjectivities. I think that's a really unhealthy thing in politics. Mm. Apart from uniformity of opinion around Beyonce and Tottenham Hotspur, which is fine. I don't want. I don't want signed on for Beyonce. <laughs> Tottenham Hotspur, I'm out. I don't want our agenda to be totally set by uh, turfs, but I think it would be remiss not to mention the furore that you're currently involved in, or the shit show going on in your mentions. Let's call yeah. it. Yeah. Well, uh, no, no, I've blocked a lot of them. So. Blocked a lot of them <laughs> it's it's going on in Am- Amnesty International, the human rights charities <laughs> mentions. So you've been. <laughs> You've been booked to host an Amnesty International event on Sunday. Yeah. And lots of people have taken offence. Yeah, which I will still be. I'll be hosting the Women Making History event at Amnesty International headquarters. It's free in the daytime. You can buy a ticket for the evening. I think you might have to get a ticket anyway. Um, And yeah, I am comparing. I will be very sparkling and charming as I always am. (laughs) But I will be primarily introducing panels and discussions of activists. I am very um, young, very recent to activism as a trans woman. I do not consider myself an expert on my own, own turf. You are, hey, <laughs> and, uh, hey, and, uh, hey. and I. Uh, um, so you know, some of the women that will be there will be really impressive. Most of them, of course, are cisgender women because most women are cisgender women. It's not all about me, so let's just say that. Um, but yeah, You've never people heard Aries say that before. <laughs> But when, um, but seriously, yeah, when, the minute, as is common, as happened with Paris Lees when she was in vogue for their new suffragettes piece, oh, yeah. as when Lily Madigan was elected women's officer, when they said that they would like me to host, I was like, a trans woman at the centre of an event that's listed specifically for women will be controversial. And they were, they said they got that, and I don't think they quite got how controversial it would be. So yeah, um, I'm a man, I'm a male imposter, blah, blah, blah. But um, I'll still be doing it. 
So. On the positive side, you've got loads of oh, yeah. really supportive comments. Yeah, and thank the... you for everyone that did do that. Anyone that's watching, thank you if you did. Was there anyone and... surprising who leapt to your defence? By surprising, I mean fit or rich. <laughs> no. Um, no, uh, uh, sometimes it's quite... I like fo- how you think, Ash. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. No. Always on the hustle. <laughs> 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 yeah um but yeah and i feel like that taps into i mean like the i have seen some of the abuse i have like obviously skim read it it's the same as ever it's like you know it's the idea that essentially i'm a patriarch in a dress mm. even though i'm not wearing a dress and very rarely do uh, <laughs> that never gets old um i uh i am a patriarch in a dress coming to tell women oddly how to be, cisgender women how to be women that amnesty have given me a platform to get up with a mic and be like I have been living as a trans woman for the last three years and you've all been doing fucking it up for like however long since you were <laughs> babies. So <laughs> here's how to woman correctly, which I won't be doing. The thing, I, I looked at the, to be honest, I didn't read the whole fucking petition. It seemed a bit bizarre, <laughs> but I just looked at the image at the top and they'd screenshot, you know, when anyone tries to attack anyone online, they find the most yeah. offensive tweet mm. they can find. And I was disappointed at how inoffensive the tweet they screenshotted was. It was you saying... I know I have children aged 18 and 19 following me. Listen to Aunt Sean when she says, <laughs> be sluttier than you are while you can. Well, it was because, one, I really wasn't, and I really, like... I think don't, I'm not asking you to cover. justify no, that No, but tweet. I'm going to t- say it. <laughs> I wasn't, and I regret it. But also, <laughs> yeah, and I believe in context of the time, it was part of a tweet thread, and I think it was quite obvious that I was doing children in the kind of Paris is burning drag, by the way, because I specifically list the fact that, like, you know, their ages are not those of children. But, um, yeah, but what's really distressing about that petition I guess is that like um, the kind of twisting of that like so for example some of the signatures say it uh, is sexually inappropriate towards children and again this like fits into this really really um, the, the sharp end of transphobia as it was with homophobia is to liken trans women to sexual deviants to paedophiles in particular um, which is something I've read about myself and pretty much every other trans woman I can think of who has like any kind of public platform and I feel like that's the problem with like the media debate that's going on. Obviously, no one's going to say that, uh, you know, no editor or um, television producer is going to claim that that's what they're trying to promote. But when you invite this kind of interrogation, knowing that we live in such a transphobic society, you invite the people that have this kind of level of vitriol um, to feel emboldened to spew it and to feel like that they may have a chance to derail trans rights in this country and if they they can go hard or go home, so they go hard. And that's what's been happening for like the last year. Mm. And like, I, I know I say this a lot and I catch a lot of shit for saying this is that there are so many parallels between uh, trans misogyny and the misogyny that I face as women of colour and, yeah, and, ra- and racism more generally. And they're not reducible. I'm not saying they're the same thing, but there are so many shared techniques. Mm. And one of the things I found really striking and it came up in the genderquake debate and it's also uh, coming up with the way that you were talking about a lot of the hateful comments that you receive is that when you are of that marginalized subject position and you know you are um particularly singled out for deviance in some way Mm. so it's not just that you're marginalized uh, it's when you're also hyper visible yeah it's that you are never allowed to be an individual and you must get this as well which is whenever there is some act of public violence in my head i'm always going please don't be muslim please don't be muslim Mm. please don't be muslim and it must be the case that if anything like fucked up happens yeah. regarding the trans event you must be thinking like please don't be trans please yeah. don't be trans, please I, ha- don't be trans. I have to say like i feel i think a lot of the cohort of um the types of feminism that um provide provide a cover for transphobia also provide a cover for islamophobia mm. it's something that i've like distinctly noted again i'm always a bit concerned as a white person not to flatten out um oppressions but I mean, like, I just think it's also good sometimes to be like, how do we mm. learn to even relate to other people? Sometimes it's like by seeing the similar patterns. And it is obviously one of those things that's really conscious. So for example, just like, um, there are of course trans women who've committed violent crimes that exist in the world. That's just, there will be, we're people. So like having those people reply to me is exactly the same as like being, you know, a, mm. a Muslim being uh, made to answer for terrorism. Yeah, cause you apo- don't- Either to apologize yeah. or to explain it away when I cannot explain the actions of another person. Also like, cause you're not allowed to be an individual. You're just <laughs> not allowed to, you know, cause <laughs> white men never have to deal with this shit. White men never felt, an ounce of responsibility for Jimmy Savile because they never had to. They yeah. never had to. Whereas I know when if there's an issue of sexual violence, which I take really seriously because that's part of my politics, and the perpetrator is South Asian or is Muslim, I know that I have to do this kind of like weird two front battle of dealing with 
endemic violent patriarchy and then also the like racialized yeah. othering that's at play there and um you know and what was funny is that after doing genderquake i had loads of these turfs in my mentions it's obviously like pales in comparison to um what you get but what was really like funny to me um is that lots of people were saying that you know i had outed myself i, I came out as trans during this genderquake debate <laughs> yay mm. me um and, you know, people were like combing over my body for like, you know, telltale signs that mm. I'm trans. And it was in the most racialized way possible. Yeah. And it was kind of, it was kind of jokes to me because, you know, I it's one of those things which like, hang on, you intend something as a derogatory comment, but it's not actually because like trans isn't loaded with like derogatory meaning for me, like anymore, like, mm. you know, maybe five years ago, this would have been upsetting, but you know, things have changed in my thinking. And so, you know, the, the, sort of saying that, you know, it's obviously trans and someone's like, yeah, look at her five o'clock shadow. And I was just like, bitch, I'm Bengali, right? We all have that. <laughs> like, that's just, I'm just brown. Yeah. I'm just well, I feel, brown. I feel like there is, like, obviously there's a huge element of kind of like racist ways of perceiving gender too. Mm. And I've had conversations obviously with like trans women and trans feminine people of color who have like, you know, I've interviewed them or whatever in my own journalism. And there's a dialogue there about how um, even like in trans femininity it's easier for me as a white trans woman to mm. access a kind of approved form of femininity and like for example like um, black trans women are already contesting with the idea of like you know like blackness being associated mm. with masculinity even for cisgender black women mm. so like you know and I think Casta Semenya is another one but even like Serena Williams who mm. like who doesn't have a kind of like a hyper uh, hyper androgenic I think uh, condition like the racialized ways in which she's spoken like being like and you know d d like i don't de-womaned like mm. femininity being refused mm. um yeah obviously it's in, it's incredibly inflected by race as well but i think that offers like a, a neat counterpoint to one of the um genuinely trans exclusionary radical feminist positions which is well don't trans women ultimately reify patriarchal constructions of femininity by wanting to assimilate into mm. them and you know there are certainly hugely patriarchal elements to all of our gender performances as women whether you're trans or, or yeah. cisgender but i know that for me personally that it's not always the most woke impulse that i've felt in my life but because i feel so consistently excluded from femininity to have that be recognized sometimes and in order and to be recognized as some, sometimes delicate or worthy of protection and i know that yeah. these are deeply patriarchal constructs yeah, feels right. like having my humanity recognized mm. so yes in some regards it holds that patriarchy but in other regards it is also a site of resistance and comfort yeah well the weird thing the i think the strange thing about the way that in particular against trans women trans misogyny works is that it tries to place us back into the category of men but knowing that we have none of the structural power of men mm. so like it's not like you think well they're just they're just calling you a man it's not bad to be a man what's the problem it's like yeah but i don't actually have the power agency of a man like mm. i still actually do have to like think about where i walk how i look like all that happens is that i've had people like i've written for the guardian when i wrote about guardian uh, a piece for the guardian about trans women and women's refuges i um wrote about like my own experience of like having mm. men follow me home or whatever like late at night or whatever and some people's reaction some radical feminist reaction to that was that i looked too male to really realistically have men follow me or treat me as a woman right. which is really bizarre because it's like you know like I, I date men that have only ever dated cisgender women before and like what's they put me in the woman box like that could mean that they could be abusive if they were abusive mm. men I think that one of the most powerful moments of the Genderquake show, I mean, again, sort of like horrible, it was a very sad but powerful moment, was when Monroe was sort of contextualising the fact that there were people in the audience calling her a man, because it's like, mm. not only is that sort of deeply offensive, but I've spent my whole life mm. with dysphoria, feeling quite mm. self-conscious about sort of like my gender identity. So the fact that like, I've dealt with this for, for decades, mm. and it's been really difficult for me, and now I'm here, and you're all your all you're saying to me is exactly the thing that I've yeah. had the most conflicted right. yeah. relationship well, to. Well, the, th the thing is I want to say, like, about misgendering, for example, if, like, for... It's very hard for... But what I kind of try and get cisgender people to grasp is that there's the kind of, like... You know, if you just want to understand it superficially, it's polite. You call people what they want to be called. That's true. But it's not just about, like, impoliteness, because fundamentally what someone is saying when they misgender you is everything that you've, like, worked so hard to assert about yourself against, like, all odds, people whose families over this, people who, like, risk violence, is I have the power always to take that away and to say that you are not what you say you are and that there is some essence that you can never run away from, which 
is what trans people have been told over a lifetime. So like it's inherently, um, you know, it's inherently a very psychologically dominant act um, and one that's upheld, you know, by the power stretches in society. Like ultimately, if all of society and state chooses not to recognize us, then we have no, you know, we have no power in that we were aware that we're a minority. So it's a very dominant bullying mm. act on a deeper level as well as just being rude. I mean, it is, again, like talking about these parallels, hearing the way that you were talking about that is like, you know, despite all the work that you've mm -hmm. done yourself, there is this thing, this <laughs> essence you will never be able to escape. It's like, oh my God, that is how it feels when, in particular, there's a racist lexicon which is centered around like dirt, smell, hair. Mm, um, yeah. You know, like my best friend who's Turkish used to get called kebab at school. Like, you know, people still will yell stuff about like curry at me or stuff about like my skin being the color of feces, like stuff mm. like that. These are all things that have been said. And it's not like I'm angry because as you said, it's impolite. It's like suddenly you feel stained and tainted and there is this thing that's holding you back from mm. like humanity and you know legitimate social space that you can never escape no matter how hard you try yeah exactly and that's how it feels i mean that's 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 yeah. the like experiential heart of being marginalized in that way yeah and it shifts as well and it shifts to like so even in the media sometimes like mainstream media you get flashes of like frankly um people's obsession with the idea that like can there be a woman with a penis in fact i think that was a question the that researchers asked name. yeah so people are obsessed with this idea because it's like the body shock image isn't it of like what a trans woman or a transsexual is and fundamentally though it's not that because like there are trans women who've had sex reassignment surgery but they don't like ultimately it's an ever narrowing thing because fundamentally then it's your chromosomes or it's your male socialization or if you display any anger any confidence anything it's suddenly well, that's evidence of your essential maleness and thuggishness oh. i mean can i just say that from a limited <laughs> amount of time of you know trying to argue for a more trans inclusive feminism i've been sent more dick pics by trans exclusion radical feminists in like two months than i ever had in 25 years of heterosexuality <laughs> which made me think that my flirting game was whack <laughs> like what was i doing it's like the new grinder we should compare <laughs> Uh, I want to move on the conversation to the Gender Recognition Act because obviously it's not an accident that this has become such a controversial or such an ever-present issue, let's call it that, yeah. in sort of the media at the moment. And that's because the Tories two years ago, I think, proposed changes to the Gender Recognition Act to mm. change uh, the, the hoops you had to jump through, basically, mm. or ho the hoops someone would have to jump through to be recognised legally mm. as their... Uh, as their preferred gender yeah. uh do you want to explain a little bit about what the gender recognition yeah so actually Act reform would mean yeah so actually your legal sex is kind of a watery concept in, in english law so like essentially like in 2004 um trans people stephen whittle and christine burns who impressed for change they kind of like um through the through a judgment of the european court of human rights got the gender recognition act 2004 permitted and it allowed trans people to change their legal sex um on their birth certificate um, by a mechanism called a gender recognition certificate. And that was done because um, trans people had a fundamental right to privacy, um, to not have been outed about their past. Um, there had been instances, for example, of marriages that trans people had entered, and obviously same-sex marriage wasn't permissible, so like marriages had been annulled when it had been, you know... Well, there were cases mm. like April Ashley, the model, the trans model in the 60s, like her husband knew she was trans when he married her, but it wasn't a valid marriage. And then when he, like, when they, well, we we're going to come to divorce, he didn't want to give her a legal settlement, so he just had the marriage annulled, like revealed, you know, that she, she was born male. Is that the so, case even now that gay marriage is no, illegal? No, so things have moved on. It was a very progressive piece of legislation at its time. It's not so much now, very few trans people use it. What it requires is like, you have to have lived in your acquired gender for two years, which again is quite difficult to prove. So they go on stuff like when you change your name, whether you're in work, which... What does that have to do with anything? To prove that you've been living appropriately. Which when in, oh, what half of yeah. trans people mm, are yeah. unemployed? Yeah, Juliet, yeah, Juliet Jakes writes about this. Like it's, it was quite common. I think it's less so now to see trans women working in charity shops because if you've got a volunteer job, that would fulfill the requirement. What, and they'll ask your boss? Or what, the last yeah, it's like boss. if you have pay slips, so you have to produce pay slips, like things that show consistently, uh, like use of like misses or miss or mers. Um, so you have to show life evidence. Then you also have to have two medical reports, and you have to answer about surgery. And the trans inquiry the government launched in 2015, it found like you know there was evidence about like 
trans girls who are 18 or whatever transition at 16 being asked really inappropriate questions about whether or not they're planning to have sex reassignment surgery and they hadn't even you know had sex yet and stuff like that so it's invasive it's dehumanizing it's been a kind of principle of international law um so for geeks who care it's like the agata principles which is an international legal agreement on like gender and sexuality and then european council resolution 2048 has like set the kind of standard internationally should be that trans people should be able to have a mechanism for declaring their own gender in a demedicalized process that there's no panel that you send off a pack of evidence to as this happens now where they decide on the evidence whether or not you are who you say you are whether or not you're a man or a woman enough and there's no form of appeal as well if they say no um so yeah the principle in international law so it, it it's law in argentina colombia Malta, Denmark, Norway. It's going to come to force in Sweden. The Republic of Ireland um, exists and uh, Portugal has just introduced it. Um, that's like a total population of 64 million women. And the, I don't believe like, womanhood has been radically redefined as is often alleged in those countries. Um, all it does is it just provides you. You swear a statutory declaration and then you file that and it allows you to change your documents more quickly. Um, so, like, I already changed my driving license on self-declaration. I changed my passport on self. I have a female passport and female driving license. It would just allow me to do that in a quicker way because mm. I've had to, like, each time apply to different agencies. Um, oh, that's interesting. So there's different. So at yeah. the moment, you'd, it's it's not there's one certificate. It's no. the, a person well, it's who's transitioned has to, to apply to each. Yeah. Like, when's like when's the last time you got your birth certificate out? I've never. I don't know if I've ever seen my birth yeah, certificate. Yeah, exactly. You're not like you're not even actually supposed to produce it. Like people. He's my even... father. <laughs> so for you, is this a big? Um, is this a big fuss about nothing? Yeah, yeah, it is. I, I, I and I like it's one of those things when you say it's a big fuss about nothing, people just can't believe that that's true, and they think obviously I'm pushing an agenda. But really, the, like there are things that there are more radical beliefs that I have about gender and about trans feminism than whether or not we should be able to change our birth certificate. Changing our birth certificate won't affect anything. It literally gives me no more of a right to enter a, wom a women's space than I have already because mm. I don't produce a birth certificate. It's a bit like the analogy I use is like with gay marriage is that like gay men can get married in this country but can they actually walk down the street holding hands in a lot of places they wouldn't feel safe to because of like social norms and actually what governs my entry to women's spaces are is kind of a social fabric that determines I have to look a certain way I have to pass a certain amount I have to behave in a certain way um, all of which I feel forced to adhere to so like the fact I'm five foot seven is an assist but my voice isn't so like it's a uh, Oh my god, are we being? Are we, this is like Eurovision all over again. Yeah. <laughs> We're about to have like you know some drunk Stage progress invasion. members. Yeah. Like... I don't know if the mic picked that up, but there was like a stampede down the corridor, which felt like we might all have been under attack. Yeah, so like all of these things, and like I think that's you know a lot of what uh, when trans women are aiming for femininity as well, a lot of it is about safety and about allowing us access to those spaces. Like, so actually, it's governed by that. It's not governed by the Gender Recognition Act. And what I'm starting to notice now is that even the media is starting to pick up on that and they're starting to talk more about the Equality Act and other provisions because they've kind of realised that they're, they're flogging a dead horse with this. Like, mm. there is literally no problem. I mean, in, in terms of to what extent does this present a challenge to cisgender womanhood? I mean, not at all. <laughs> it's about, I mean, it's about equality under the law. But I think this takes us to some quite interesting territory about... Um, to what extent does um, a demand for trans equality under the law mean that there is some kind of public recognition on um, a view of gender and a, a non-essentialist view of gender? Because this is something I've been thinking about a lot, which is um, I do think that um, one's rights in a country are about a lot more than just equality under the law. Like you were saying that there are all these social barriers to mm. equality which means that you do have to achieve some kind of cultural shift and there will always be friction in achieving that cultural shift. And then you've got to ask yourself what kind of friction is acceptable and what, how big is that cultural shift anyway? And one of the things I was thinking is that ultimately it doesn't really matter who has a biologically essentialist view of gender. I mean, I probably still have loads of biologically essentialist views mm. about my own gender and how I think about it. Um, but what does it matter to me if someone doesn't have those same views about my gender or their gender like yeah. it doesn't it doesn't you know either weaken or strengthen my relationship to my own body and as for you know equality under the law like we all have ideas and unconscious biases which don't 
manifest themselves in the law and like yeah. the law act- actively holds us back from acting upon and, that, and that's a good thing so i think like where the conversation is has to be able to i think um strike a middle ground which is unsurprisingly very rare in politics which is thinking about like well actually where do we want to go and what are the acceptable compromises on the way to getting there um and i'm talking about socially not mm. not in terms of mm. law where yeah. i think compromise is dangerous but i think that's a good sort of point to move the question on a bit in terms of at the moment there's as you were describing earlier sort of like quite an un- unhealthy log jam uh, in the media where it's all debating these quite abstract things about self-definition and they're getting on people who are quite sort of obsessed with excluding trans people from all sorts of places and groups and theories. <laughs> um, but, and this is all about the Gender Recognition Act. It's all sort of centered on this concept of self-definition, which from what you're saying seems to me, one, a bit of a red herring for the people who are arguing against it because it won't actually change much. But two, potentially, should that even be the priority for trans rights activists or should we just be changing the subject to talk about something altogether different i mean like i feel like the kind of standard thing well there's a huge breadth of opinion amongst trans people right as well so like middle class trans people like, they're, like as they're rising like say gay politics is like there's always been this tension between like the kind of middle the idea of the bourgeois white middle mm. class gay man who's pursuing kind of like a set of legal rights for himself and where does that fit into like um the gay asylum seeker who is is a risk of deportation and like where where do the politics of those two mm. men meet probably nowhere and um and and there's the, the same exists for trans people so there are fundamentally different priorities and there is a kind of legitimate criticism that obviously like when you pursue um legal rights um in parliament you know in the media which itself is very white very middle class it is already an agenda that benefits some trans people quicker than others and that's true I don't think it's, frankly, the most urgent priority facing trans people. I think transphobic violence is. I do think, like, um, perhaps, like you know, the state state detention of uh, trans asylum seekers um, and healthcare, um, because healthcare is like access to healthcare is one of the biggest things in terms of like mental health and therefore physical health ultimately of trans people. Is there anything that gives you positivity about public understanding of uh, the life of a trans person because I mean as, as you were saying Ash sort of like what you learned was a lot from a particular experience with a particular person um, I've changed my sort of like I've gained a lot more understanding reading this mm. book by Julia Serrano um, but and I was I, I admit I was a little bit confused before mm. then about what I thought about everything and both of those experiences are quite rare not yeah. not the majority of the British public aren't going to pick up that particular book by Julia Serrano or yeah. have a close friendship in university with someone who's trans. Yeah. So what do you think is the most effective way yeah. that we can move forward towards sort of like a better public understanding of what's going on? I mean, and th- do you see any positive beginnings of that happening? Yeah, well, I mean, I think there's been the kind of idea which I've always been a bit critical of. I wrote a piece for Trans Day of Visibility this year that like, the idea of like media representation and diversity, and I think that goes for any kind of diversity, has its limits because it's like this idea that like people will see an other person, be able to like see them, empathise, and then like accept them, and actually that's proven again and again to be faulty. Like, it's a start though, is it not a start? It is a it's start. It's obviously limited. But... Yeah, it is limited. I think it's predicated on an assumption that we experience a shared humanity, which I don't think has existed in any point in history. Oh, that's quite an extreme Big statement. statement. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. That's, just, that's, that's just my yeah. view. I mean, I think, and yeah, and I think um, what it also requires, I, I feel, I mean, like, you know, to a certain extent, I engage in it. So one of the things that, like, put on a personal note, like the trolling, one of the, like, really vicious stuff that happens to me when I'm trolled by, uh, like, transphobic troll accounts is the ones that, like, obsessively follow everything I do and will write really tailored nasty tweets, for example, about, like all using male pronouns, but like, oh, just spends all his time on dating apps or whatever, you know, like, and it's like- Who doesn't? I, yeah, but actually the weird thing is that I actually do consciously on my Twitter and stuff like that, I do talk about, um, I do make jokes about my personal life, knowing that I have like MPs follow me, knowing that I have people in the media follow me who are essentially following my feed to learn more about trans people mm. is that I feel like I have to humanize myself by being like, look, I'm going on a date, like, aren't men trash or, like, I'm just a girl, like, the rest of you... I feel like I have to perform that kind of relatable womanhood as much as I perform the the othered 
trans person. Um, yeah, and I feel like, but I feel like that's incredibly exhausting a lot yeah. of the time, and not everyone wants to do it. And that's the problem, I think, is, you know, Julia Serrano can want to do it in a book and then not want to do it the next day, and I can want to do it, like, in a tweet one day, but then not necessarily want to do it, like, you know, on a news item. Yeah. But is that, is that not, like, the issue with the identity at the heart of identity politics, which is the minute you start doing some work which is based on um, representational inequalities, and that's before you even get to redistrib- redistributive inequalities, which I think are much more powerful determining factors in terms of trans people's vulnerabilities, in terms of homelessness, in terms mm. of employment, in terms yeah, of assets, of um, in terms of uh, street violence and the uneven handling of that. Um, by the but, criminal but justice one follows system. from one can follow from yeah, the other. I mean, right? they, these things. So, have I mean, a, these... Gay, gay people. It became much easier to get a job when sort of like the legal debate sort of increased acceptance of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, these things have a relationship. I'm not denying that they do, but I'm saying that you know, um, we can. I think because of the dem- the, the relative democratization of uh, media platforms because of social media, we can map out a representational strategy in which um, it is possible to see diverse models of womanhood and have that be very, very successful, but it might not have any traction in terms of um, dispossession or state violence. And I, and I think that that's mm. the, uh, one of the um, impasses that we're reaching in liberation politics more generally and that's not just to do with trans rights things that's also a huge issue with anti-racism with feminism and so on and so forth um, but in terms of that representational aspect is that it is deeply deeply exhausting like not just to do that work of humanizing yourself but to um, turn yourself inside out in many ways mm. and to have you know the entirety of who you are or a version of who you are which is predicated on a sense of candor um, be for public consumption all the time yeah. because one of the most precious learning tools that we have in our arsenal as human beings is making mistakes and to not be able to do that mm. or to feel that those mistakes will be scrutinized in such a way is I, I think yeah. um, can be deeply atrophying in terms of personal development and that's one of the other things that we'll have to think about in terms of you know as we map out strategies for liberation politics which are able to marry the representational and the redistributive is thinking about that representational aspect essentially not, you know, stealing your soul. Yeah, I said, yeah, and I agree with that. I think, um, yeah, and I think also like awareness of like the, the f- who controls the forums in which that takes place, because obviously that's always one person essentially being on the stand. And also it will be like, and I think again, this is something that I, yeah, I feel like it brought me into greater awareness perhaps than I would have had about how other forms of bigotry like racism etc like function is about the sheer repetition and one of the things that I see I often don't I know I do it but I see it when other trans women do it it's like how experience repeatedly experiences are denied to us so for example the uh, it will just be stated almost that we don't fear male violence or that we we don't know what it's like to experience sexual assault um whereas you know and that that's actually very common and then to see trans women having to like disclose mm. like this really sick me too with no sympathy <laughs> mm. like again and again it's really really common in particular i see it a lot on social media and i just sometimes like you know i've i felt compelled to do that at times but actually sometimes i just want to like grab some like like you know trans women and be like don't do this you don't owe this person an mm. explanation of trauma you don't have your trauma shouldn't have to be your evidence do you think that's in part a, I mean, we've talked about this on the show before about sort of like how debates on the left often cash out at the moment, which is sort of like a competition. I mean, that's a particularly sort of unsympathetic way to put it, but sort of like the debate is often about who's more privileged or who's mm. had a sort of worse experience. Yeah. And that seems to be to some degree how this debate is yeah. happening in some circles. It's the idea where um, cis, well, well, this particular set of cis mm. female feminists say sort of like we experienced an oppression which someone who was assigned male at birth hasn't experienced yeah. and then that forces um, trans people to say no actually we've experienced all these oppressions and it sort of requires a lot of uh, uh, opening yourself up to sort of like yeah. what, what potentially quite painful experiences and whether or not it would be possible to move to a more sort of like affirmative politics which say it doesn't matter who's been more oppressed like we're here i mean that was the that was the thing yeah. of gay rights wasn't it we're here we're queer get used to it yeah born this way deal with it like it's not necessarily saying you, you weren't competing with anyone else yeah. to say well, I've, yeah i feel that discourse often arises though from a, I, I feel like it's like a 
heavy-handed um, response to like people trying to deny you experience any oppression at all. There's almost like a slippery slope. It, it, like yeah, and, and the reality is, is it's really weird too because I'm not just a, you know like I'm not just a trans person. So obviously like I can't really like yeah I feel like there is a kind of productive sort of like absurd element to I much would rather look at like what are the shared experiences. Mm. Um, but I feel like it's a kind of anxiety. This is a kind of broad point, like an anxiety within womanhood itself. I feel like the way that patriarchy kind of works sometimes is that like the worst kind of violences are committed by men, but then quite a lot of the policing of gender or women's gender is is like handed to women in a kind of hierarchy. Mm. I think in terms of the stuff about suffering vulnerability is that um, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's actually really important to have spaces in which um, we deal with people's pain yeah. and, and, and the pain of existing under various power structures. I do think though that there is a kind of fetishization of suffering sometimes within feminism mm. um, which compels women into the strange dynamic of being seen to be the most abject um, and kind of like piling suffering upon suffering. It you know, as a way of, of claiming space and I, I do think that that's something which is distinct and quite unhealthy um, and that's not to say do not be open about having suffered, but it's also recognizing that that is also coterminous within the logic of womanhood, where to be a woman is to suffer, and mm. that's you know there's nothing currency, yeah, yeah, you know, and that's not there's nothing particularly radical in that either. I think that um, you know the the history of women's collective identity, self organization, and um, progress that's been made is not a history of you know the the suffering saints like you know pierced mm. by arrows with like tears in eyes it's one of resistance and resilience and coping strategies and joy and affirmation as well in the face of tremendous violence and i think that that's one of the things that in all forms of politics needs to be returned to the center is that essentially um all liberation politics are a politics of vitality mm. and of hope and mm. of joy and the idea that we do not have to lead quite such immiserated lives yeah and to me that's a really powerful organizing tool yeah well it's very interesting to me that for example the other side of this kind of divide of feminism and that would call themselves gender critical because actually mm. i just think like well accepting that gender itself is a system that like we're all subscribed to but also is like is violent is dangerous is toxic is like yeah i find almost like i've always found in trans feminism kind of like like you say a vitality in the idea of like of autonomy that we do not we do not have to be um it's like when people will say um yeah but what about f i i prefer facts not your feelings and it's like but why why is there this like idea that feelings or emotions should be always surrendered to kind of like if you like the flesh to biology to the oppression that someone tries to tell you you are nothing more than your body and your biological processes why like why wouldn't you want liberation from that and see a similar kind of liberation for trans people who are trying to say I am essentially more than like the narratives that have been imposed on my body. It's post-modernity though, isn't it? And this is what <laughs> Wendy Brown gets so right in Edgework. Um, phenomenal, phenomenal um, collection of essays on feminism. And I think I might have even like sent it to you some, like months ago being like, I found the explanation <laughs> for trans exclusionary radical feminism. And I think I read it out in the fix as well. So it's one of those things which you read and you just go like, ha, nail, head. <laughs> and it was, you know, there. It, and you know, she identifies it as a distinctly post-Cold War phenomenon. And so when we think about post-modern feminism, we normally think about like, you know, third wave feminism, indeed trans-inclusive feminism, because I think it just means that you're breaking down the old dynamics. Whereas Wendy Brown says, no, post-modern feminism is that feminism which has um, admitted defeat on the front that feminism can be in some way revolutionary. And so this is a feminism which has a, you know, more than fleeting attachment to the present circumstances of immiseration and doesn't really think that those things can be changed. Mm. And I think that, that trans-exclusionary radical feminism, that uh, failure to imagine, um, you know, what collective identities outside of this rigid coupling of, mm. you know, the body and gender, what this could look like, is that postmodern feminism which is ultimately feminism cannot change yeah. uh, one's relationship to um, one's own body or indeed the body politic yeah and you see it approaching it sometimes so sometimes discussions where they're you know um, transphobic people are desperate to talk about the medicalization of dysphoria and stuff like that it's very interesting that the idea that they don't believe that within trans uh, like you know trans inclusive not just trans inclusive feminism like trans feminism itself trans uh, feminism led by trans people that we don't also consider issues about how 
you know, I'm someone that seeks medical treatment for my dysphoria, but I recognise that there could be the potential of a future of a world where it wouldn't be medicalised in such a way. That doesn't mean I should be deprived of it now. Just like, you know, the, there are ways that we can envision a kind of utopian world in which actually that might become less important. And that could be something you can do without being like, this is bad, you shouldn't exist, we're going to take away your hormones. <laughs> <We're gonna do. laughs> I can imagine that being on their t-shirt next time Channel 4 well, debate, is, but actually. they have been like look, have this that? is what I mean is that when I mentioned Janice Raymond earlier 70s radical feminist is that she was she advised John Hop the John Hopkins hospital she, like there were radical feminists in the 70s who presented papers to advisory groups advising not to include in you know in the American health insurance system not to include transition related health care because they believed it was like you know essentially a negative thing should be mandated out of existence and kind of like a patriarchal medical construct that if you didn't, you know, if you didn't encourage it by funding it. And that was that was radical feminists that provided mm. that kind of like, if you like, sign off. Um, and, and there is a history of that. And I do believe that if it, I don't believe radical feminism in this country in 2018 is empowered enough. I think we're seeing it's like trans exclusionary radical feminism. We're seeing it's kind of um, death rattle. But I believe that if they if they gained any traction at all, they would take trans people's healthcare. Yeah. But you that was I was going to ask for. I think we should start to wrap up. I was going to ask for sort of like a a hopeful note or a positive note at the end of it because I mean obviously a lot is. I mean, there's the the last two years and especially sort of like from your account today, it just sounds like relentless. Mm. You know, the amount of pressure and the amount of sort of like public vitriol sort of like that you receive, mm. like. Yeah, I really feel for you. <laughs> you know, that sounds so tiring. But also a lot does seem to be changing uh, yeah. quite quickly. Um, and understanding seems to be growing quite quite rapidly. Yeah. And I don't know if you sort of like do feel hope that sort of like future generations of trans people will find life easier and sort of yeah. like where you see those signs of hope at the yeah, moment. Yeah, definitely, of course. Like I'm I'm actually very hopeful. Like I mean like the thing is like it's one of those things like, yes, I'm being like trolled right now on Twitter, but I am also being like offered a place to speak about some issues to an audience full of like cisgender women and feminists who are campaigners who are in that space on Sunday mm. to talk about this stuff like you know and you know in, there is constant hope like actually you know like obviously I've done work with Stonewall with other LGBT charities when you see like young people's attitude towards gender I mean because I do think like the generational divide narrative about like all, all old people are transphobic and all young people are perfectly accepting obviously is reductive but on the whole, like I do think younger people, as a rule, are much more relaxed about this in a way that they mm. were like became much more relaxed about sexuality than their parents. You had yeah, you had exactly the same thing with gay yeah. people. It's a cohort do, effect, yeah, right? Yeah, and like and on the whole, you know, I do think yeah, there are spaces for people and there are movements um, for for trans for a lot of trans people, not all, but for a lot of trans people in British society to like find a space to to, to work towards collective action. Um, and to build solidarity with other people there are those opportunities Ash some hope I feel really hopeful I feel really really hopeful and the reason why I feel hopeful is because I was teaching on um, like trans exclusionary radical feminism for my politics third years last semester and lots of them are like you know real lads in lots of ways and so I was trying to teach it in an even handed way where it was very clear where my own sympathies lie, lie but I also kind of wanted to present a counter argument because it's, it's not yeah. healthy in a seminar to just be mm. like Grrr. it's alright I don't, I don't I we're, not gonna like have, we're not going to have a go at you for platforming <laughs> in terms of, yeah. so I was trying to explain like the whole like bathroom debate and all of my students every single one of them and not all of them identified as feminists not all of them you know are like left wing actually most of them aren't um, just looked at me like I was completely batshit when I was trying to explain this mm -hmm. position about like you know why trans people shouldn't be able to use the toilets of their choice they just looked at me like why are you wasting our time with mm. this this is clearly an unreasonable position and as that scorn was being heaped on me by my own students I felt a tremendous and overwhelming sense of hope that they couldn't even entertain mm. this position anymore yeah. doesn't mean transphobia is over doesn't mean that it wasn't present in that classroom at all but it meant that on that issue there was you know a significant step forward from where things were even five years ago mm. great i feel more positive now yeah yeah uh Good. yeah thank you so much for both coming on thanks uh well we should do this again soon <laughs> <laughs> without the mics and cameras <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh good luck with your talk on sunday thanks you'll be sick <laughs> thank you
Uh, this was Tiski Sal. We'll be back next Monday. Uh, I'm sure there'll be loads of things going on on Navarro Media in the meantime, but I didn't do my research about what they were. So in the meantime, <laughs> go to support.navarromedia.com. We always need some money to pay for the upkeep of this studio. Pay Keep for me in lip gloss and yeah. like vodka, please. These haircuts Donate. don't come for free. <laughs> Actually, mine does. My best friend cuts my hair. Really? Yeah. Well, um, well, yeah. No. Looks, it looks great, babe. Yeah, I know. Uh, I pay him in beer. It's great. Also buy a t-shirt. Very comfortable. <laughs> uh, this was Tisky Sour. Good night. Bye. Bye.